Hi, hello. Thank you for joining us for this virtual presentation at the Behavioral Health Tech Conference. Today in our presentation, we're going to be talking about the role of national standards in shaping the future of behavioral health innovation and quality care. Our goal is to share some foundational background on national guidelines and their place in creating quality care tools. We're going to share some insights both to entrepreneurs building new solutions as well as systems and buyers looking to better understand how to evaluate and implement new technologies. We're going to include examples from a national guideline called the ASAM criteria and the process utilized when building a gold standard software for substance use disorders. So a little bit about our speakers today. My name is Bill Liu. I'm the Senior Director of Health Technology at the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM. My role is to implement ASIM's guidelines into tangible evidence-based software solutions. My prior experience is at a digital health startup where I helped lead the organization through a period of rapid growth, expansion, and acquisition. Fundamentally, I am a technologist and I believe in the possibilities of technology to advance and reshape the future of healthcare. And I'll, now I'll toss it over to my co-presenter. Thank you, Bill. My name is Mayi Lahiro, and I am the Associate Director of the Health Technology Team at ASAM. I work in support of the clinical integration of the continuum suite of products. I am trained as a clinician, and my background is also in extramural research, namely academic research, technical assistance and training, and health technology. So you may hear all of that reflected in my content. So in this discussion, we're going to pose one fundamental question. Why does behavioral health innovation still lag behind innovation and in other physical health ailments? We know there's historical stigma around mental health and substance use, and that has led to fragmented reimbursement and historic carve outs of our population. And we know our population has unique characteristics as well. There's oftentimes non pharmacological treatments. We rely heavily on the clinical and support systems of each person and individual. And oftentimes the result of this has been historic subjective practices and diagnoses that didn't follow along the actual standards. So we're going to pose this question today to keep in everyone's mind as we talk about national guidelines, their role, and then ultimately how this rate relates to innovation. Thank you, Bill. So in the short time I have today, I want to establish a framework for understanding standardization, national guidelines or national standards, and the role that they should play in innovation. So I want to begin with some shared language so that we're all on the same page about terminology. Standardization is the process in which stakeholders choose universal or generalizable healthcare products and services. So in behavioral health, this could mean therapeutic interventions, pharmacologics, and treatment protocols, among, among others. These selections are based on data and evidence-based results and are intended to adhere to the highest quality with cost effectiveness in mind. Okay, so I mentioned evidence-based. We are defining evidence-based in the behavioral health and SUD substance use disorder space as any of the aforementioned therapeutics, interventions, pharmacologics, et cetera. These have been developed using scientific or research processes like studies, clinical trials, or meta-analyses. When we discuss parity in this context, we are referring to the rules on how mental health and substance use disorder treatment are assessed, accessed, I'm sorry, and conditions for coverage. For instance, under some plans, permission may be required. National guidelines and behavioral health. These are evidence-based recommendations, and now we know what that term means, designed to guide practice and care. You may also hear them called clinical guidelines or practice guidelines. These are all similar. They are used to inform how providers care for certain conditions. And these are built by experts based on consulting a number of information sources. On this slide, we list research, expertise, and patient values. I wanna take a minute to parse apart what we mean when we say research. On the previous slide, research is an umbrella term uh, for the compilation and mining of what we call health data and research findings. These are gleaned from multiple sources, and some of them are on the screen. 
This means that they allow for a population level lens view, meaning that health status and health outcomes within a group of people or society at large are being examined. One way in which we refer to this is population's health surveillance, and that allows us to plan, implement, and evaluate public health practices. That is really what national guidelines are for, public health practices. Okay. So another vehicle referenced in the umbrella term research on our national guideline slides are peer-reviewed research literature. Many of you might have thought of that when you hear the word research, especially those that come out of the academic background, I do. So literature research that are considered peer-reviewed have gone through an evaluation process in which journal editors and other experts, scholars, sometimes panels, critically assess the quality and scientific merit of the article and its research. Articles that pass through this process are published in peer-reviewed literature. Anyone that's ever submitted a research article to a peer-reviewed publication understands that this process can be grueling. It can require revisions. Uh, there can be a lot of back and forth. There can even be rejections and the bar can be high for publication. I've been through this process numerous times and I can say that it is very grueling and arduous. The second source here on this slide is Graylit. And this is the broader term that refers to products that come from various sources. This could be all levels of the government, academia, business and industry, electronic and, and print formats that are not controlled by commercial publishing, which means they have not gone through peer review. So what is the advantage of having Graylit as a broader term? Because of the length of peer review that I described, the process can be uh, cycles and cycles of review and feedback. A major advantage of Graylit is that it doesn't have to go through that process and thus can be published and disseminated more quickly. Why is this important? Because at times there are emerging issues in which we want to quickly disseminate information to providers or to the field. And the process of review involved in peer reviewed literature is going to uh, prolong our ability to get the information out. But because of this, there is more onus on the expert or the person evaluating Graylit to determine credibility. So that means that, um, you know, for instance, with the government, it's probably not going to be an issue that there is credible uh, underpinning to what is being published. Through other sources, we may need to evaluate for bias or other things that might uh, impact quality. Okay, so now that we know more about standards and what they mean and how they're built, I just want to give some examples here very quickly on screen of entities that are producing uh, national guidelines in this space. I would say that SAMHSA as a government uh, entity is very productive in terms of treatment improvement pro protocols, technical system protocols, and other guidelines. APA does the DSM-5, ASAM will talk about our criteria. The CDC during COVID was uh, very active in providing guidelines and, and guidance on COVID safety, provider health, uh, population health. And then we have the Department of Defense and the VA that focus very heavily on the military populations and the World Health Organization, uh, which does the ICD now 11. So at the end, there are some resource slides giving examples of these uh, guidelines that have been produced by these entities. So it'll kind of give you a sense of, of what they are disseminating to the field. All right, so Bill began the presentation by asking an important question about why innovation is lagging behind the behavioral health and substance abuse fields. I think it's helpful to talk about the policy history. And in order to do that, we need to consider one major legislation, which is the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. This is a federal law that passed in 2008, so really not that long ago. The gist of the law is that health insurances and insur insurers have to provide mental health and substance abuse at the same cost sharing arrangement as medical or surgical benefits. Before this act was passed, coverage for behavioral health care often required a higher level of cost sharing and special service limits. What does that mean? Patients were paying more for services or were being charged more and often could not pay, and there may have been capped on, this, capped on the, the number of services they could receive. So this was a long uh, process to get this bill passed. The problem was first identified in 1961, and but the efforts really didn't start taking off steam until 19, the early 1990s. That meant for 30 years, patients were uh, uh, receiving or care that was very expensive or was cost prohibitive. 
It's important to note that this history of this bill represents a bipartisan effort, which I think um, you know, it was really meaningful for me to hear that both Republicans and Democrats had identified this as a problem. And thus, the first iteration of this bill was passed in 1996, but had no solid capacity for enforcement. This allowed health insurance to take advantage of loopholes loop and enlist other restrictions which prevented compliance, which largely, largely rendered this version of the legislation a symbolic win. What did that mean? Patients did not feel much relief from the cost of care. However, during this same time frame in the 1990s, consumer advocates, and in this field, we, we mean, when we say consumer, we mean people impacted by these disorders, began uh, to press for the ben for benefit parity at the state and federal level by beginning to frame the issue more explicitly as an anti-discrimination measure. In October of 2008, President Bush signed this uh, this as a provision of a larger law. So it was namely their efforts as consumers and framing in such in a different manner was successful. Parity facilitates equitable access to care, thus improving the standard and quality of living for those impacted by a mental health or substance use issue. Denial of care or unfair cost sharing will create barriers to care for individual quality of life and create worse population health overall. And we've talked about what that means in terms of the numbers. So um, now I'm gonna switch and talk a little bit about ASAM as an organization. Um, ASAM was founded in 1954 as a physician-led organization. There are now more than 7,000 members, as the slide says. Of note, the organization's membership, like the addiction field, reflects a shift in the addiction provider landscape, which means there is a growing number of non-medical professionals in its membership, and these would be clinicians like myself. Okay, so now I'll give a very brief overview of the ASAM criteria. The ASAM criteria is a national guideline for assessment, level of care placement, treatment, and ongoing care, as well as discharge, with an emphasis on the least intensive care utilizing a patient-centered approach in an operationalized format. So when we say least intensive care, we're talking about um, making sure that wherever the patient, the patient is placed, it, they can be served without the least amount of disruption to their lives, but also serving all of their needs. So that means that if someone can be served in intensive outpatient, that uh, we would, we would uh, treat them there as opposed to putting them in a residential treatment, which might mean that they cannot go to a job or be with their family. So uh, the holistic approach that is the ASIN criteria allows us to evaluate that and does respect that the patient is, cannot always sacrifice certain aspects of their life, but does deserve effective care and should get it. All right, so here you can see a representation of the core components of service delivery and clinical sequencing from assessment going forward. This is kind of a fancy way of just saying that uh, this is the way in which a, a, a patient matriculates through uh, the continuum of care. And you'll notice that there is kind of that, that arrow that loops them back, which means that there may be reassessment. And so it's not, it's not just conceptualized as a linear process, but there may be cycles and rounds of treatment in order for the, the patient to, to be healthy. All right, so the principles of ASAM criteria are all listed here. I want to highlight just a couple of them. Uh, Bill will touch on some of the, the others later when he discusses the software, but a few are relevant to this portion of the, um, my presentation. Uh, I want to talk about individualized and patient-centered care, which is highlighted as a shared decision-making or what we call collaborative care. We will come back to address individualization, also known as customization, a little bit later. But I want you to note that it's reflected in the principles of ASIN criteria. There is an expectation in, within the criteria that co-occurring disorders will exist, that they are not an exception. And this is important because it acknowledges, it acknowledges the complexity in each patient that must be accounted for and expected. But we're not seeing a person come in with one issue. We are seeing a person that has uh, that may have a constellation of things. Uh, all of us are complex, and we want to make sure that um, that when we do an evaluation under the ASIM criteria, uh, we are accounting for all of those things, and the, the structure of the criteria allows us to do so. 
All right, so the fourth edition of the ASIM criteria, which is our textbook, was released in digital form in early October. The last edition was published in 2013. So as you might expect, much has changed in the field. The focus, like any updates to a national guideline, is on reflecting the most current science. And you see that on this slide and evidence-based practices, that's that term again, I told you to come up. You will notice here the use of chronic care in the framing of addiction treatment. I want to briefly address addiction and behavioral health broadly as chronic care conditions. Research interventions and health data have all demonstrated that these conditions are not usually episodic, meaning that they can and often do require an understanding of their cyclical nature, ongoing care needs, and wraparound services. Hence, you saw that error on the previous slide that says that reassessment is necessary that uh, patients may uh, need to be treated more than once. And so there's an understanding that we're not just moving in one direction. Sometimes people have stumbles and we, we expect that. Oh, briefly, lastly, the fourth edition has a particular focus on clarity. And this is important because sometimes textbooks and criteria and standards can be so dense that they're difficult to apply. And so in this version of the textbook, there was real, uh, note made and intention put towards uh, making it clear so that it could be implemented accurately in the field. So a working document. Okay, so now I'm gonna make my final case for uh, the essential role of standards and in innovation and quality. We began the presentation by providing a common syntax for delivery of care. As we said at the beginning, this is the foundation for beginning any conversation. Standards use common language so that we all know when we say level one, what is uh, included in level one, what staff we should expect, what kinds of treatment, how frequently. And so if we don't have a shared understanding, a shared definition, then we cannot understand each other. Equity. The use of standards promotes equitable practices wherein there are rubrics for effective, efficient care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics or demographics. That doesn't mean that we don't adjust to the person sitting in front of us. It means that we don't uh, withhold care or change care because of the person sitting in front of us in a negative manner. So three and four here are related. Um, throughout my talk, I've em emphasized the phrase evidence-based. Good, reliable, timely data helps us to say with greater certainty that our care and approach will address the problem. So we wanna make sure that because it's built on data, we can expect that, uh, that likely the person will be served in a particular manner. Lastly, we have cost saving. One of the considerations of standards is to maximize costs and utilize resources effectively. I refer to this in the beginning of my section, maximizing available resources allows for us to better access, uh, to better access for uh, patient care. From an administrative perspective, we are informing profit margins, staffing, resources. The reality is it takes money to run programs and to pay people. And so we always want to keep that in mind. And uh, very rarely does anyone forget that other thing. Standards can help guide these calculations. In closing, I want to address an inherent tension in the standards conversation that is the argument for customization. So there can be a framing that standardization works against customization and vice versa. Customization can also be referred to as individualized care. Standardization has been framed as the enemy of customized care because there are times where standards have been used to restrict or deny responsive care or care that deviates from the recommended guideline. This is not ideal and can be dangerous and certainly can be regarded as the opposite of patient-centered. Customization is important for the increasing number of patients with multiple comorbidities where the medical evidence does not provide sufficient tailored insights and where the patient may be far from the average case that drove the standards. That means that there are some patients who come in who have so much complexity or such an interesting constellation of things occurring that the standards don't reflect what, they, what is needed well. If you recall, the ASAM criteria emphasizes co-occurring disorders as an assumption thus baking customization into the approach for care. In patient-centered care, an individual's specific health needs and desired health outcomes are the driving force behind all healthcare decisions and a key part of patient-provider collaboration and mentioned collaborative care. So in any effective in innovation, 
the innovations that are underpinned by standards, it is also important to acknowledge, reflect, and account for customization. I would argue these two are not at attention. And so because the ASIM criteria is able to reflect that customization and recommend it, it is possible. So innovation should be built on standards that make room for customization. And with that, Bill is going to build upon a now shared understanding of standards and discuss approaches for innovation. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Naila. So now that we've established the definition and summary of guidelines in behavioral health and why they're important, let's shift gears a little bit to talking about practical application. We'll use the implementation of the ASAM criteria as the basis for looking at this. So the ASIM criteria work across all stakeholders in behavioral health. From the upstream perspective of states and other federal regulatory groups using the criteria to organize treatment services, these regulatory rules are written in a way that adopt the ASIM criteria guidelines specifically into legislation and requirements. At the midstream level, payers use the ACM criteria to establish their payment structures. And these are tied to the specific service level types and the established regulatory rules we just talked about. At the same time, the actual groups like technology partners, EHRs, and other reporting systems will build solutions in alignment with these requirements. Education groups at this midstream level will then create courses and content for providers and patients or payers that are aligned with these principles as well. And ultimately on the ground then, providers and patients use the criteria individually in practice and assessment to comprehensively assess and determine appropriate placement for level of a care. This way, just as Naila said, we provide a common shared language and standard for all so we can understand each other. Now let's talk about ASIM criteria innovation, specifically this practical application of a guideline. We're going to use an example for how we bridge the gap from science and a national guideline to an on-the-ground product solution. We're going to share some of those lessons learned and hope that serves as a basis for further adoption in innovation. So while the criteria are the most widely used set of standards, we found throughout history that their implementation to fidelity was, was inconsistent. We saw a number of issues that presented themselves through this widespread misuse. There's a lack of high quality assessments in the field. This included minimal standardization and oftentimes subjective assessment practices that were built for a specific group or population or area. There's misunderstanding and misuse of the criteria. Some systems implemented selective pieces of the criteria, or they changed them and altered them to fit internal guidelines that didn't appropriately implement it to fidelity. And overall, this is, this is governed by ineffective oversight historically. There's a lack of authority really to, to monitor program quality, and compliance was often self-reported, and this presented a lot of challenges naturally. Often this is, this is coupled with that limited resources available to the overall field in ensuring appropriate application. On the ground level for providers, this meant that they had minimum education and, and training on the criteria. They didn't have the adequate training and that led to interpretation variety variability. There are integrated care challenges. I think it's not surprising for all of us to know that the health IT structure in behavioral health has been historically lagging due to those reasons that we've identified. And this caused lack of integration of high quality tools in those EHRs and those other reporting systems. And this fed overall then with that ineffective oversight. Those groups that were trying to aggregate all that data to look at outcomes, look at allocation of resources and what the needs were for their specific system weren't able to do this properly. And all of this then led to minimum innovation in our space. So what we did was take these inputs and these challenges that we experienced, and it was identified that 
we needed a standardized ASAM criteria software. We wanted to create something that would serve as a gold standard for the field that helped address some of these challenges. And when we applied that to our actual product design, we use these key tenants as drivers for that product. We created a comprehensive biopsychosocial clinical assessment. And in this way, this would serve to be a high quality assessment and hopefully replace some of those homegrown, lower quality ones used in the field. Product interoperability was at the heart of our design. So fundamentally, the software that we created was meant to be integrated into a client record system like an EHR or other health exchange. And then we use constant product improvement at our core. So we realized that we weren't going to create a perfect solution up front, but we wanted to create something that could evolve along the latest research, identify gaps that weren't working well in the software, and then have this feedback loop to iterate and and ultimately improve the tool. At the same time in this process, we use this feedback loop to feed into actually improving the ASAM criteria holistically, the actual text. Through the data that were collected nationally, we identified multiple gaps in decision rules, improvements in decision rules, and this overall fed back data to the editors of the ASAM criteria and ultimately created and helped implement the fourth edition. And ultimately, at the heart of this, we, we wanted to ensure that we're actually improving patient outcomes and lowering costs for the field. So the result of this approach was a software tool called the ASIM Continuum. Now, ASIM is a small medical nonprofit. We've never created a software before. We're not a software development company, and we have limited resources. So we realized our limitations. So what we did was actually approach other partners in building this out appropriately. At the time that this was being conceptualized, SAMHSA had a grant project called the Open Behavioral Health IT Architecture Project. And we were able to collaborate with SAMHSA to fund the creation of this ASAM software. Additionally, the grant included a provision to partner with a private software company in order to actually appropriately build out a software version of these decision rules. So we collaborated with a private company called FEI Systems, and this approach ultimately was able to create this ASAM continuum. Now, the tool is computer guided. It's biopsychosocial, as we mentioned, but it uses a structured interview approach. So in this way, it's going to explore all six dimensions of the criteria comprehensively. It will look at co-occurring conditions as well. Um, and the final result is a determination of the least intensive but appropriate ASIM criteria level of care recommendation. But because we used an interview approach, we wanted it to be highly branched and individualized for the individual. We still wanted to preserve that patient-clinician rapport and trust building and allow the ability for the patient to tell their story in the manner that they want to. We didn't want to keep it rigid like many of the other instruments that were used in the field that had a specific requirement and way in which it needed to be asked. So even though we thought we took a well-informed product design, we had to make sure that it was actually meeting its intent. So research and validation were at the core of our values in building out this product. We looked at the reliability of the tool and, and saw some high good quality reliability between initial tests and any retesting and across different types of, of individuals conducting the assessment. Feasibility was a, a key benchmark that we looked at. 60 minutes as a median assessment time was our goal because we know that fits into a billable hour for a clinician. So it's something in which they could actually then take and say, okay, I can actually make this work in my day-to-day. -day. We conducted that concurrent validity with other instruments. And we partnered with other external research groups to conduct tests on, on outcomes, on matching. And what we found was that we minimized negative outcomes 
from undermatching and for overmatching. I think we can all understand how undermatching someone to the intensity and level of services they may need is naturally going to lead to a negative outcome. But what we saw in our data and the research from this tool is that overmatching has equally negative outcomes. If there's a recommendation for someone to go to a residential level of care treatment, but in reality, an outpatient treatment services is more appropriate for what they need at that point in time, then that individual is less likely to show up. Their life circumstances may not make a residential treatment program possible for them. So we saw this in the, in the data and in the research. And then we looked at predictive validity across various systems. So in public and VA systems, across multiple states, across the country, and even abroad in Belgium and Norway. We looked at it at multiple timeframes, immediate intake assessments, periods of 30 days, 90 days, and, and one year for long-term outlook. And we looked and assessed across multiple different outcomes. So the result of all of this research and approach, we found some pretty hard data. There was significant reductions in no-shows to the next stage of treatment. If you think back to my example of someone being appropriately matched to their, their service levels, that they're, they're actually likely then to, to show up. And if they show up first, then they're likely to, to continue with treatment. And so we saw a 30% reduction in dropout as well. And over the long term, we saw improved addiction severity outcomes over time. And patients ready for step down, lower intensities of, of care on that continuum of care. Now, ultimately, we had a goal to solve a problem for multiple stakeholders. Of course, patient improving patient outcomes is a core driver of anything that we build. But we needed to be able to, to find buy-in from other stakeholders that are involved in the process beyond just the clinician and patient level. So by using this evidence-based and research approach and, and demonstrating some of these improvements in patient outcomes and decreases in costs, we're then able to get buy-in from payers. And by having a standardized data set, we can get buy-in from systems like states, and, and other Medicaid operators, because they can actually look at a standardized data set and collect their data across the system. So we saw an, a result of streamlined patient flow and reimbursement opportunities with the utilization review and payer process. One example of this is by getting buy-in from a specific Medicaid payer, that they automatically accepted results of the ASIN continuum that was conducted by the clinician. They were able to actually minimize that back and forth review process between the clinician providing that justification for why this patient needs this level of care service and, and actually having that accepted and paid for and getting that patient to treatment quicker. So all of this is a win for every stakeholder across the board. And we would want to emphasize that taking this approach to solve a problem for multiple stakeholders is a key tenet of why evidence-based approaches are going to be beneficial. Now, our in-person conference is taking place in Phoenix this year, and so we thought what better than to highlight a case study within the state of Arizona this year. So in this past year, we've conducted a statewide pilot project to implement the ASAM continuum across Medicaid providers. We took an approach where we met providers where they were at. We integrated the tools into their existing provider EHR systems so they wouldn't have to learn a new system, manage uh, multiple different login systems, and not have their data speaking to each other. So we met them where they're at, but we also solicited buy-in from system leadership. Arizona Medicaid or Access was a key partner in crafting this project design. And we also created a steering committee of provider and state leadership and influential folks around the state. We found pilot programs that were technologically friendly and open to adopting new technologies. 
and we were able to work with Access to identify further incentives using more carrots and not sticks for adoption. So that included increased reimbursement incentives for each assessment conducted with the continuum, as well as technology reimbursement for implementing more and integrating more of these data elements into their EHR systems. This way, we we're also able to get their EHR vendors to buy in as well. And in that approach of meeting providers where they're at, we use self-paced training as a core tenant. And we didn't require folks to show up to a specific date and time that may or may not have worked for their schedule. So you can see we used a collaboration between all these stakeholders to actually build a groundswell and, and get buy-in. And we were able, we were also thoughtful in actually looking at our benchmarks. We didn't just roll this out to all of these programs and expect them to just be able to be successful with it. We used key milestones and measured them throughout the year. So as we wrap up this conversation, we just shared our perspective from ASAM on how to build from an evidence base, but also be informed by the individual challenges of the stakeholders that you work with. So taking this back to what you can take away as a builder, maybe as someone looking to create a new startup, most of you bring years of experience and subject matter, matter expertise to your field. But we also wanted to share some of these core components that you could use as a takeaway. We talked about the ASAM challenges of doing this as a small medical nonprofit that hadn't built something like this before. We leaned into knowing what our strengths were in the literature and the science and found willing partners and stakeholders to engage with us to actually do this appropriately and correctly. So let's look at some of these components that, that you can take away. So we would recommend using a product strategy that has a long lens, delivering value across multiple stakeholders. Don't just look to solve a single problem for a single individual because you want to get a foot in the door, but look at that long lens at how the downstream impacts are going to affect that individual you're working with, but also the stakeholders that they need to work with. Have a strong company ethos that follows the science and uses that as your gold star, as your North Star, excuse me. Think about the driving force behind why, and I can assure you, you'll get more willingness to adopt your new technology or find more willing investors if your value proposition shows that it was built on the evidence base. And there's a, there's a saying in our field that digital is never done. So think about your core product features and iterate. Don't create the perfect solution up front. Uh, but have have your company ethos still be the one driving what you focus on from your roadmap and features. And then think about strategic foresight of where your technology field is, is moving. We created this tool that operated a lot in the public entity Medicaid space, and we knew the HIT in that field is, is years behind, to say it kindly. Whereas if you're creating a solution that is consumer focused, that may be looking to interact with clinicians and patients more likely, then look at modalities like, like mobile and meet them where they're at. Being patient-centered is a word that gets thrown out a lot, uh, but it's really key to identifying what your technology infrastructure is and will drive success or not. Now, we also wanted to share a few insights into groups that are evaluating new technologies. So if you're a buyer, you're a system that wants to be innovative, what are some of the questions that you can ask to determine if this, this product that you're being approached with is actually going to be a good one to roll out in your organization? Here are some of the key questions you can ask. What's the evidence base they built their product on? Do they have any validation studies, any research, any hard data that was conducted that they can point you to? Have they done their homework? Do they know the guidelines and the language that govern what is important to your population you're working with or the folks in your organization? Ask about the structure of the product development team. Ensure that the company that is approaching you understands what their ethos is and that they're not going to pivot on a whim down the line. You know, you don't want to get into a situation where six months down the line that you were working with a startup and there were a lot of features that were really important to you, 
And now this company has landed a large new contract that focuses on a completely different set of features and they deprioritize or sunset any features that are actually impactful for your organization. So you need to ensure that there's a robust product development team that is, is focused on the features important to you. And then within your own organization, you need to ask how it's going to impact the folks in your organization. Who's actually going to be leading the charge? It's really important to get top-down leadership to invest and in, to invest in this new technology and rally the full set of stakeholders across the organization. But it's also really important to work from the bottom up. Finding internal peer advocates that believe in the new technology that will actually be the ones interacting with those that are required to be using it is fundamental in ensuring success. You know, we've all heard stories, we've all probably been in situations where we get dumped some new change management or some new tool to use, and no one really knows why. You know, everyone kind of just shrugs and throws up their hands and, and they say, you know, this is just what we're being told. And those are never really going to be successful long term. So think about how to lead this process, both from the top down leadership perspective, but also folks on the ground. So we wanted to thank you for joining us today. We hope we've highlighted the importance of national guidelines as it relates to building innovations. We want to show that building from an evidence base and quality as your core tenants, you'll have a lot more success in your new technologies and you'll have a lot more success within implementing this in your organization. We hope you take some of these lessons learned to inform development of those innovations. Now, at the end of the slide, as Naila mentioned, we have some additional resources, both geared towards where builders can look at finding grants and finding funding to spur your technology more quickly. And also what she mentioned about guideline resources. So some of the ones you can look at that can set a foundational knowledge for yourself. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your conference.